Welcome everyone to today's webinar, What COVID-19 Means for Importers. We're really happy you could join us today um, on what might be one of many Zoom calls that you have today. We know this is a really crazy time and many of you are probably working from home, managing your business, managing your supply chain, maybe managing your family. Um, there's a lot going on. It's a, it's a real challenge and we're really happy that you took the time to, to hear from us and, and hopefully we'll be able to help you out today. My name is Devora. I'm on the marketing team here at Fredos. And um, for anyone who doesn't know, Fredos.com is the world's largest online freight marketplace. We help thousands of importers like you compare, book, and manage uh, um, all of your freight across over 75 providers. We help you navigate pricing with real visibility into the current market, manage all of your shipments and billing in one platform, and we round that off with some great technology and human support. If you haven't already, you can sign up for free at Fritos.com. So today we're going to have three short presentations um, from three different speakers. Our first topic will be important freight data and how it affects importers. And for this topic, we're gonna hear from Judah Levine, who is our research lead at Fredos. So that means that Judah is the one who pours over all of the freight data coming in. Um, he pulls out the relevant insights for us. We're really happy to have him here to walk us through what's happening in the freight and logistics world. Our second topic will be crucial importing challenges and how to face them. We're really pleased to welcome Robert Kakatrian, founder and COO of FreightRate. Um, FreightRate is a global logistics provider um, and they are a seller on our Freightos.com marketplace. So that means that Robert is really on the ground in the trenches um, day in and day out with what's going on, what, some, what the challenges are for importing right now. And he can help us get practical in terms of what to expect, some tips to manage. Um, so we're really happy to have Robert here. And our final topic for the day will be booking with Fredos during COVID-19. And for this topic, we're gonna to hear from Ari Corman, who is our VP of sales at Fredos. Um, and Ari is um, dealing with customers all day um, with actual booking challenges. So he's gonna help us understand what we need to know for booking right now on Fredos.com, any challenges you might face, any tips that he's able to share to, to help get your goods moving as, as quickly and um, efficiently as possible. So with that, we will jump into our first topic. Thank you, Dora. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Uh, so what we're going to be looking at is the, the data we have and the trends going in the industry relating to the COVID-19 outbreak and the um, latest developments going on so far. So Edvor, if we just go to the next slide. So really, since uh, the start of February, the very end of January, the story has been uh, China's shutdown and the recovery. So with the Chinese shutdown, it had a major impact on Chinese manufacturing and on the preparation of, of goods to, to export, so the global supply um, of a lot of the goods that get shipped all over the world. Um, and the outbreak, of course, also impacted the logistics workforce and the original side of logistics um, in China. Uh, getting the ports operational, getting trucks moving again. Um, as China has recovered, the story has unfortunately now shifted to U.S. and Europe, which are now increasingly contending with outbreak in their own countries. Um, and we're seeing, obviously, we're seeing uh, restrictions, we're seeing economic shutdowns, we're seeing travel restrictions, and uh, we're starting to see how this will impact logistics operationally. And then, of course, what is the impact going to be on, on consumer demand, on demand um, for businesses as well? All for goods that need to be shipped all over the world from China or, or exports as well. Um, so, uh, so unfortunately, there's a lot of question marks. Obviously, we can't tell exactly uh, what's going to happen next, but we can kind of review what's happened so far and, and, and try and uh, uh, in some way uh, gauge what we can expect. So if we turn now to the next slide, uh, looking at the, the situation in China over the last uh, couple months. So the shutdown there began officially at the end of January, on January 25th. Although of course the outbreak had started earlier than that. Um, and in the Chinese experience, it took about six to eight weeks for a return to some sort of normalcy. 
Um, now, of course, things aren't completely back to normal. I think schools there are still closed, but in terms of manufacturing and logistics, um, uh, Devorah, if we just continue down the slide, uh, in terms of um, manufacturing and, and logistics, it took about that amount of time for manufacturing to, to return nearly to full capacity. So the expectations are that by the end of the month, um, Chinese manufacturing will, in most regions, aside from Hubei province or from, from uh, the epicenter where uh, the city of Wuhan is located, uh, will return to nearly to full capacity. And logistics capabilities are also returning nearly to full capacity as well. And we can see those trends or this rebound being reflected in ocean and air rates, which we're going to look at now. So if we look at our next slide. So here we're looking at the example of uh, container rates. This is from Freitas's Baltic Index, or the FBX, which is uh, an engine rates uh, for 40-foot containers. And if we take the example of um, rates for the shipping container from China to the U.S., if we start in the left hand of this slide, we see this uh, this peak that's um, in the, towards the beginning of January. This is the lead up to Chinese New Year. And then you see a, a, a plateau through the beginning of the shutdown, which would be typical for, for during Chinese New Year. And we see that plateau dip um, into uh, the end of February and towards the beginning of March, um, as there was just nothing coming out of, of China. Now, prices didn't actually crash because ocean carriers uh, very aggressively canceled or, or blanked sailings, canceled a lot of, of ships to reduce the capacity since there was almost nothing coming out of China. But if we look to the right of the, of the uh, graph in the last two weeks, we see a real spike. And this was expected that there'd be a, a real rebound in prices once manufacturing picked back up and, um, and there was stuff ready to ship back out of China again, uh, prices were gonna go up as people competed to, to really get the, those orders onto ships. Um, what we see over the last week though, if you look at the very right hand edge of this, of this graph is a leveling off. And uh, there are two hypotheses on, on why this might be the case. So one is that uh, carriers kind of overestimated um, how quickly the production in China would return and there's not as much goods ready to ship as, as they thought to be at this point and the prices will level. But we see prices did not skyrocket, right? They didn't even get as high as they were um, in the build up to Chinese New Year. The other possibility for this level off, excuse me, <coughs> The other possibility, which I think unfortunately is more likely, is that this the spike in prices are representative of um, U.S. Uh, shippers who are order placing orders, trying to clear that backlog during the shutdown, but from before the coronavirus outbreak really reached the United States and before it's really being felt there kind of domestically. And what this leveling off might be, um, uh, um, what this leveling off might be is uh, representing this starting to be a dip in demand uh, 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 coming from the U.S. demand of, of Chinese goods uh, coming from U.S. shippers. And we've seen a couple indications of this so far. Some reports are that big enterprise shippers are actually going to cancel uh, orders that they had coming out of China. And the other is that some carriers have started to blank sailing for the beginning of April to cancel ships coming out at the beginning of April in anticipation of a lower the demand than they had initially expected. So in terms of ocean rates, we've, we've seen um, how, how kind of the, the outcomes in, in ocean uh, pricing so far and some indication of, of where this is going, at least in, in the near term. If we go to the next slide, uh, we'll, to look at how um, it's been impacting air cargo. So air cargo has been a completely different story. So uh, passenger flights have been canceled out of China since since the start of the shutdown at the end of January. Um, in the last week or two, <coughs> excuse me, in the last week or two, um, flights have been canceled, or many flights have been canceled uh, between the U.S. and Europe as the U.S. has placed travel restrictions um, on travel between the between the U.S. and Europe. Um, most, I'm sorry, in normal circumstances, about half of uh, air cargo travels in passenger planes. Between the US and Europe, about 60% of US Im imports uh, that are normally carried by air go in, in uh, passenger jets. So, <coughs> sorry. 
the canceling of these flights had a major impact on the capacity for air cargo. And at the same time, there's also been a high demand for COVID. So pharmaceuticals, medical supplies, other types of things necessary for contending with the outbreak that are generally coming out of China or Europe, um, there's a spike in demand for those things. So combining the, the removing of this capacity plus the high demand for these time-sensitive goods is really impacting rates. And if we go to the next slide, um, we'll see something, I think, remarkable. <coughs> because of this really Stay healthy, Judah. tight capacity and because the passenger, yes. Sorry, can you hear me now? Just saying, stay healthy. Oh, yeah. This is allergies. Don't worry about it. Um, so uh, because of this, uh, you know, passengers are for the most part grounded. And because there's been this big spike in, and because there's been this big spike in, uh, uh, in demand for these, for these time-sensitive goods, many uh, uh, or several passenger airlines are repurposing passenger jets to, for use as cargo. And that's what we see in this picture here. So all this combines to say that uh, rates are very volatile. Rates are spiking sometimes unprecedented levels for air cargo, um, for, for regular air cargo flights, as well as for charters. Um, rates are highly volatile, volatile. We have reports of rates climbing more than 200% or, or even tripling sometimes in a matter of days. Our own uh, data out of the marketplace shows rates out of Asia uh, increasing by like 100% on some routes, 60 to 100% uh, in the last couple of weeks. Uh, um, <laughs> shipments that do get to the US, and, and I'm sure this is true for Europe as well, as we'll see in a second, they might not necessarily get as close as they normally would because they have to get on the flights that are going. It might not go to the hub um, as close as it normally would. There may be um, less capacity domestically for flights, and that sometimes uh, the last mile or, you know, the second to last mile is going to go truck, uh, which also would, would um, impact uh, timing and delays. And that brings us to our last slide, or my last slide, rather. So if we look at U.S. and Europe in terms of what's going on domestically, so we've kind of looked at the, <coughs> the impact of what was going on in China, as well as how uh, different restrictions are relating to air cargo getting into Europe and the United States. But within the US and Europe themselves, of course, we're also starting to see uh, the impact and starting to see impacts on logistics. So in the US, as of yesterday, 20 states had shut down directives of varying degrees of, of uh, severity. Um, the EU has also closed cross-border travel to, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> has closed cross-border travel to, um, to passengers. And in both these cases, um, there's been exemptions for logistics. So logistics are considered essential services and they're exempted from any of the restrictions that are coming across, but it doesn't mean that they aren't being impacted. So it's actually loosening restrictions for, for truckers, loosening right, uh, normal regulations to help truckers move more quickly. Uh, the EU is also trying to, to give priority lanes to, to trucks moving through borders. Uh, because of these types of restrictions, we see that there's been some uh, big delays in trucks getting across borders uh, as people are adjusting to these uh, to these new restrictions, and that might ease in, in the coming days as people get used to to the new um, reality. Um, in Italy, trucking was is was delayed and was a problem uh, uh, as well. And we also know that in China, uh, a big pain point during the recovery was trucking because there was a lot of restrictions in terms of uh, border crossings um, which which hindered the trucking industry and also truckers moving from one area to another were sometimes required themselves to, to enter into quarantine. So for now we're not seeing um, uh, big delays or big problems but that's something that we want to um, keep an eye on. And finally in terms of ports really U.S. ports and, and European ports so far have been have been um, uh, but there are some initial signs of impact. So on the one hand, we have the impact of lack of goods coming in from China. Uh, so in uh, in Miami and in Seattle, there were uh, terminals at each of those ports per day or for a number of days for lack of activity. And then there was also an instance in um, Houston where one of the terminals shut down temporarily because of uh, a worker um, positive for for the virus so as I said it's so far so good but these are possibilities um, that 
that logistics in these areas will be will be affected. So as I said, unfortunately, this leaves us with more questions than answers. Uh, but I think it gives us a picture of what's going on at the moment and some perspective on what we expect in the short term. So with that, I'll, I'll hand it over to Robert. Thanks so much, Judah. Um, yeah, so that gives us kind of the, the overview of what's going on from the freight side, from the data side. And now we'll, we'll move on to Robert um, to get into more practical what's been going on for shippers, what you can expect, and, uh, and some tips for how to manage. So I'll hand it over to you, Robert. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, thanks, Deborah and Judah, and uh, thanks for having me, guys. Um, these are definitely very challenging times for importers. Uh, as Judah mentioned, uh, there are severe uh, disruptions for air freight. Um, as uh, as Judo, Judah's uh, slides also show, the uh, vast majority of air freight uh, actually travels uh, on passenger flights. Uh, so all these cancellations are having a um, huge effect on, on movement of goods. Um, we see a lot of uh, panic out there uh, and a lot of bad information. Um, so, uh, but we also see uh, a lot of interesting solutions to these challenges. Um, uh, I'll, I'll share with you sort of uh, from the front lines of, uh, of all of this, uh, uh, what these challenges are, what you can do about these challenges, and uh, also what you can do about these challenges uh, if you are specifically an Amazon seller. Um, again, uh, the biggest challenge is um, with air freight, uh, I would say, and, uh, and uh, specifically pricing and capacity. Uh, with all these flights canceled, uh, the only carriers running most of the lanes are basically carriers who operate uh, all cargo aircraft. Uh, and uh, very few airlines who are running their passenger aircraft as cargo only uh, right now. Um, and you, we're starting to see some instances where, uh, like Judah's picture shows, uh, they're taking out seats to move cargo. Uh, this is limited, I think, to only um, emergency pharmaceutical supplies. Uh, uh, even with seats out, you can't really put uh, big items into the airplanes just because they don't fit through the doors. But uh, uh, it's still, you know, every little bit of added capacity helps. Um, what we're seeing with pricing is a little different than uh, uh, Judas data shows. Uh, we, we've seen prices on some lanes, lanes go up as much as 400% in the last two weeks. So um, the, the day U.S. announced their uh, uh, travel restrictions on European flights, uh, cargo aircraft rates went up by about 200% overnight. So. Uh, so for, from China to U.S., for example, the rates are uh, around 300% of what they were basically uh, before the shutdowns. Uh, Robert. Yes. Uh, we're cutting in a little. We're cutting it out a little bit. Maybe you could get closer to the mic. Is that possible? Yes. Is this okay. better? Okay. Um, I think so. Let's try it. Yeah. So. Um, the problem is less severe with ocean freight. Uh, there isn't much of a, a space issue, and the prices are uh, very low. Uh, and and uh, we believe they will stay low, with uh, you know primarily driven by the concern of uh, dropping consumption even after the shutdowns are lifted. Uh, the biggest challenge also is. Uh, actual shutdowns, uh, so businesses are closed. Uh, in more than 20 states now, we have government-mandated stay-home uh, policy, uh, which means a lot of companies basically can't receive deliveries uh, because there's nobody there. Uh, we don't see any uh, restrictions uh, from carriers or truckers on uh, essentials. Uh, it's very hard to discriminate against uh, product uh, categories. Uh, there is definitely nothing mandated by the government that says a trucker should only deliver, um, you know, health essentials. Uh, we do see some isolated cases where truckers refuse certain commodities just because 
the assumption is that business would be closed anyway. Um, we've seen some, for example, uh, some truckers refuse artwork delivery to galleries. Um, now, those aren't essential businesses, so uh, most likely are closed and there's no point wasting the driver's time attempting a delivery like that. So, uh, it's very uh, it's very limited that uh, that impact, and uh, we don't really see it uh, becoming widespread. Um, if you're an Amazon seller, um, you have a different challenge. As many of you guys know, um, Amazon placed restrictions on new FBA orders. They are uh, not allowing any shipments of non-essential goods to their facilities. If you already have an FBA order created, uh, Amazon would uh, allow it to be delivered, at least for now. Uh, we're not seeing them refuse anything that's, that has an old FBA ID created before the, the restriction. Uh, so, if, if, uh, But if you don't have an FBA ID, if you're trying to create a new inventory order, then uh, uh, it's, it's a little grim because there's nowhere to deliver to schools. Amazon just isn't receiving them. Um, uh, with uh, you know the shutdowns finally lifting in China and the, all these factors producing, there's a lot of goods now ready to be shipped. So uh, it's a big challenge uh, for Amazon sellers right now, uh, not being able to not just deliver their goods but also create FBA labels for the boxes to be prepared uh, for shipping. So what can you do to uh, ease the pain a little? Uh, here's what uh, we see and uh, we like uh, that some of our customers are doing, uh, and we recommend uh, recommend these things to uh, all of our customers. Uh, ship now if you can. Uh, don't uh, don't wait uh, after a six week six to eight week shutdown in Chinese factories. There is a, a big shortage of many products, not just essentials. So uh, this would sell very fast as soon as any restrictions are lifted. And, uh, you know, I, I, I would say ship it as soon as you can because we don't know what the situation will be like in a few weeks. Uh, it very well may deteriorate. Uh, it may get uh, tougher to ship things. Uh, so it's very uncertain. And I think uh, shipping sooner uh, will help you cut down on the uncertainty. Uh, explore warehousing options in the U.S. If you can't deliver to your customers or can't receive at your own facilities, don't leave the goods at factories. Uh, ask your forwarders for warehousing options. Tracking companies and warehouses are very much essential services. They are fully operational. We haven't seen any single trucker shut down until now or a warehouse shut down until now. So we can receive your goods, we can hold them for you uh, and deliver basically the moment uh, people return to work. Uh, I would also prioritize essentials, uh, and I don't mean um, toilet paper, sanitizer, gloves, uh, etc. I mean things that will be needed first uh, after some sort of normalcy returns. Keep in mind, uh, kids are very likely staying home till September. so. They will need study materials, games, puzzles. Uh, parents uh, who are stuck at home are probably reorganizing their homes and garages. So uh, there is definitely a lot of need for uh, any any sort of products that will be uh, useful to just to people who are bored. Um, I know in Argentina uh, they're not shutting down. Um, home good stores because they expect people to start renovating and uh, doing a little bit of fixing around their houses because they have so much time on their hands at home. Uh, so these are all the things that will start uh, selling very soon uh, and uh, mitigate a little bit the slump in demand overall because of uh, the situation. Um, and if you are an Amazon seller, uh, uh, resist the temptation to sell certain items. Uh, it's very tempting to start selling items that are most in demand, like masks, gloves, uh, surgical gowns, etc. Uh, we're seeing a surge in uh, inquiries, uh, uh, commercial ones for uh, people basically 
entertaining the idea as a business. Uh, all of these things are uh, classified as medical devices. They're all subject to FDA registration. Uh, and a lot of the inquiries we've seen, uh, there seems to be a spike in uh, non-compliant and unregistered uh, products. Uh, there's a high risk of uh, these products getting seized by customs, uh, getting refused, uh, not to mention the risk of people actually getting sick using them. Uh, if you do decide to trade uh, these goods, uh, you know, be very diligent and verify with FDA that the manufacturers are actually registered. Uh, there's a lot of fraud out there. There's a lot of uh, people pretending to sell N95 masks and they aren't. Um, so it's just uh, uh, from, we've seen quite a bit of that, so uh, please be careful. Uh, I would also consider other essentials. Amazon is very likely uh, to extend the restrictions on, uh, on what they receive and when they receive it. And they will also likely start lifting the restrictions little by little, by little uh, and on specific categories of products. But uh, what they treat as essential now uh, may not be the same uh, list of goods they will treat as essential four weeks from now. Uh, keep in mind, at that point, people will be home for uh, probably over a month, uh, and their needs would be very different than uh, just uh, you know the essentials that are missing now. So think of what those categories are. Uh, if some of your goods are you know fall within those categories, um, I would prioritize those, uh, ship those sooner, have those uh, in U.S. basically ready for delivery um, over some other things that uh, you know may, may take longer to uh, to basically recover. Um, the final advice again uh, would be to ship now. Uh, with Amazon restrictions, uh, you know you can't create FBA labels. Uh, I know Amazon Global Logistics uh, is struggling because they can't ship anything out of China without labels. Uh, we don't have that problem. Regular forwarders don't have that problem. If you don't have FBA labels, if you don't have an FBA ID, it shouldn't stop you from shipping. We can still pick up your goods, ship them to U.S., um, and hold them in our warehouses in U.S. Um, the boxes can be labeled as soon as you have access to the labels, as soon as the restriction is lifted, and your product can basically be delivered on a couple of days' notice uh, versus waiting uh, for Amazon to lift the restrictions and then ship from China and then wait three to four weeks uh, for the delivery. Of course, there's also the risk of uh, uh, the overall situation getting worse. Uh, so I definitely uh, suggest the option of uh, warehousing your goods in U.S. and getting them to U.S. as soon as possible. Uh, this option, the services are offered uh, not just by Freight Right, but um, uh, a few other forwarders uh, uh, that, uh, that uh, offer their services on Freight Marketplace. Uh, so ask your forwarders, uh, ask them for warehousing options, ask them for Amazon prep options, uh, and um, uh, let's get your goods to uh, U.S. Uh, and ready to ship uh, as soon as the country starts uh, to go back to normal. Um, and I think that's all I have. Okay. Um, thank you so much, Robert. Um, you're getting into some more practical tips of what people can do. And if anyone wants to read more about the warehousing option, shipping now and warehousing, Robert's actually written an article on Fredos.com that, that you can check out and, and read a little bit more about that. So we're going to move now to Ari, um, who's going to tell us a little bit about what to do if you would like to ship on Fredos.com now, what you need to know um, and how to move forward. Okay. Well, congratulations, everyone, for brave, you know for uh, braving the storm and for uh, continuing to try to, you know, run your businesses and grow your businesses during this uh, difficult time. And uh, you know, I'm glad to hear uh, you know that uh, you guys are con continuing on. What I'd like to share with you are um, some uh, some tips 
uh, when you're actually on the freightus.com marketplace site. And um, just some, you know, some easy tips to consider uh, as you uh, work with your factories, as um, both Judah and Robert articulated that are now more or less going back to normal, uh, quote unquote. And uh, as you then navigate uh, the freightus.com website with the specific uh, shipping informations and uh, information and packing lists, et cetera, ready to go uh, and planning your next shipment. So um, here are some easy tips uh, to consider. Um, so the, the first thing is, you know, Robert just uh, mentioned in terms of uh, don't wait, uh, you should book now. Um, none of us knows, none of us are fortune tellers. Uh, we don't know what, how things will play out. Uh, in general, even before this uh, crisis, we would always recommend to book uh, one to two weeks, really maximum, uh, prior to goods ready date. Uh, the factories uh, usually are, are relatively straightforward in telling you uh, when your product will be ready to ship. Uh, there might be a, a difference of a few days, but uh, not, not too significant. Uh, generally, we recommend booking uh, on the Freitas website, uh, again, one to two weeks uh, prior to that stated date. Um, regardless though, uh, because these days are somewhat of a, an approximation, uh, once you've inputted that date uh, in Freitas and as you actually do your booking, uh, the freight forwarder that you've selected uh, will any, in any event reach out to the factory and coordinate with them as they've done before. And again, from what we've seen, um, largely the uh, factories are back to normal. The only um, kind of slight delays that we're seeing are factories that are kind of more inland and uh, some of the transport uh, in China uh, going from factories to ports. But nothing, again, too significant. Most of it is kind of uh, relatively back to normal uh, in, that, in that regard. So it, now, on the other hand, if, uh, you know, if you have a shipment that's going to be ready just another a few days, it's not too late. Um, we, you, you can still book. But again, one to two weeks is a general um, you know, kind of best, uh, you know, best timeline in terms of, uh, in terms of booking on the, on the site. Um, the other thing to consider in ter is in terms of modes, and um, this is something that you always need to consider, but um, as Robert mentioned and, uh, and Judah mentioned as well, on the air freight side, uh, we're seeing a lot of volatility right now. And um, it's not just an issue of price, it's actually an issue of capacity uh, and also an issue of uh, prioritization. So um, many freight companies right now, um, are, and we recommend, if at all possible, not to ship uh, by air freight. Generally, air freight uh, in normal times is, uh, is a good way of shipping, even um, you know, on that kind of 150, 200 kilo type shipment. Um, we, at the moment, recommend really trying to, uh, to not ship by air unless you really have to. Uh, you also may want to look at Express, which is similar to air freight, uh, but in many ways uh, a, a little bit more reliable uh, in that it's usually serviced by some of the large just as of the world. Uh, so might be a little bit more uh, or less prone to some of the volatility that we see. But wherever possible, really best to ship by ocean. Unless again, it's a very, very small shipment. Uh, ocean, uh, we're seeing uh, less delays. Uh, we're seeing more uh, consistency. Uh, and we're also not seeing, we're seeing a slight increase um, on, on full container loads. As Judah mentioned, uh, kind of the 40 foot benchmark from you know, Shanghai to uh, Long Beach, which right now is about 1500 USD. So it's not uh, particularly high. It's, it's slightly higher than it was uh, the last two months, but not, not particularly high uh, in kinds of considering the volatility of the, in, the, uh, in the macro uh, you know, economy at the moment. So wherever possible, ocean freight is the way to go. There also hasn't been much of an impact at all uh, on LCL, less than full container load uh, pricing. So the same shipment um, that you need to send either to Amazon uh, or to a, a freight forwarder's warehouse or uh, any sort of fulfillment company is now actually more or less the same as it was prior to Chinese New Year, prior to the uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, crisis. So uh, really kind of ocean freight is best um, and within that, LCL, less than full container loads, have not seen that much of a change. Full container loads, slight changes, but nothing more than uh, one to two hundred dollars more than uh, you know a month or two ago. And uh, although air freight is volatile and should uh, you know should be avoided if you if possible. Um, the other thing that we've noticed on this, and this is um, I'm happy to go into in a little bit more detail if there's Q and A around it, is um, working really closely with your factories. We we have a lot of customers now. 
uh, really coming to us that had, you know, multiple factories kind of come online at the same time. And, um, and, and sometimes there's some of a, somewhat of a waiting game or the ability to kind of coordinate and uh, look at things like uh, consolidating shipments, right? So you may have two factories, um, one of which is ready with production now, another one maybe another week uh, from now. Rather than sending you know, multiple individual shipments, you may wanna look at things like consolidating a shipment. And uh, I'm happy to answer uh, any questions on that. And then likewise, um, in terms of Amazon as well, uh, in terms of modes. Uh, so there's the ability to kind of uh, ship by ocean freight. Uh, and again, to LA, for example, you're talking, you know, only something like 15 days from uh, a Shanghai, a Shenzhen. Uh, and then, you know, once you're in the US, um, as Judah mentioned, there hasn't really been any, uh, or there has been somewhat limited impact on trucking. It's hard to believe considering uh, the shutdowns in place, but we haven't really seen uh, much in terms of restrictions on trucking. And that goes as well for kind of interstate trucking, you know, from either the port or warehouses, um, you know, for example, on the West Coast, East Coast, uh, Chicago area uh, into the freight forwarder warehouses, fulfillment centers or Amazon. Uh, so um, you may, again, there are creative ways of kind of doing things as quickly as possible uh, from a mode standpoint and not, um, and not overpaying or not subjecting yourself to uh, too much volatility. Um, and then finally, uh, in terms of delays, I touched on it just now, uh, and the other speakers, I think, gave some good information about it um, as well. I see the Q&A lighting up. I hope those, we've got some good questions there, getting ready, getting psyched for those. Um, in, terms of, uh, in terms of delays, uh, like I said, on the China side, we are seeing some slight delays for inland factories, uh, you know, on the, on the China side. One small recommendation, if at all possible, you can ship on FOB terms. FOB meaning that you're only responsible from the origin port, uh, for example, Shanghai, Shenzhen, Qingdao, Tianjin, and not uh, responsible from the factory itself. And, and this gives you a little bit more flexibility or actually a little bit more control to your factory uh, to navigate some of the uh, complexities to avoid some delays on the origin side. So uh, if at all possible, uh, you can ship on FOB, uh, FOB terms on, on Freitas. And, um, and then, you know, really shouldn't see much delay on the China side. Um, by ocean, really aren't seeing much delay. Uh, air freight, we are though seeing delays. Like I mentioned, prioritization, many airlines uh, shipping uh, skeleton uh, flights or, or simply canceling uh, flights. Um, and much of what I've discussed is kind of out of China, but um, a lot of what I've discussed uh, really impacts as well in the Europe side. Um, as well. So if you're importing from uh, Western Europe, uh, also, uh, you know, a lot of, uh, a fair amount of issues more on the air freight side than on the ocean, ocean side. And then once things come into the U.S., um, as Robert mentioned, we, we are seeing some issues with uh, customs holds, um, largely due not to kind of government restrictions on imports, but, and we even saw now today, I think the Journal of Commerce had a very interesting article with some additional hours uh, being added at some of the major ports, including uh, Long Beach now, uh, offering kind of overtime workers and hiring new workers because of some of the fears around unemployment. So we're seeing actually the ports in, in many ways kind of operating at, at capacity, you know, operating uh, relatively normally. The delays, uh, though, are sometimes on, on the fact that if you're shipping kind of problematic uh, cargo, it may be more subject to uh, government inspection. Uh, and things like that. So uh, try not to do anything too crazy or weird or importing products that, uh, like Robert mentioned, may be subject to FDA or, or if you're not sure, if you're a newbie, uh, getting involved with products that are subject to FDA um, is a bad idea uh, and it should be avoided if at all possible. So, um, you know, hopefully that was helpful to you guys and, uh, you know, we'll have happy to answer any questions, um, you know, as, uh, as we go into the second part of the uh, webinar. Okay, thank you, Ari. Um, I'm sure that was helpful for people who are shipping right now. Um, we'll take a, a few questions. I saw that um, some questions were answered live, so um, that's good. Um, so one question is, how are trucking restrictions gonna play out in the US where different states might have different sets of restrictions? So that I'll turn over to, I guess, Robert or and or Judah. Uh, I'll give it a shot. Uh, the 
we don't have uh, really physical borders between the states. So enforcing uh, restrictions between the states, uh, I think, is a tall order unless they uh, the government starts shutting down um, basically truck stops and uh, and truck movement in general. I don't see practically any way of uh, enforcing uh, prioritization of certain goods uh, being moved um, outside of uh, it making economic sense for truckers. Uh, I, I can't really imagine a scenario where the government would say you can't move uh, toys from California to Arizona, but you can move um, masks. Right? There's there's no way to enforce that, uh, that that I can imagine. So I don't I don't see that really happening. Um, if there is any sort of uh, effect, uh, it would be uh, truckers basically not uh, accepting some sort of goods and accepting others because they make more economic sense. So it, it would be an economic effect rather than uh, government uh, enforcement of any sort. I think. Anyone want to add something? Okay. Yeah, no, um, I, I was going to say, I mean, um, that, that sounds about right to me. Um, as of now, I think only New Jersey had some sort of restriction in terms of whether people could be on the roads after a certain hour, but that didn't apply to, to trucks. And that's really been the only thing so far. Um, like Robert said, there were some, some uh, state run truck stops that were shut down in Pennsylvania and that have since been reopened as it was really uh, an inconvenience and causing delays for, for truckers. Um, and uh, private truck stops as well are trying to accommodate as best they can. So, so as of now, we're really trying to help keep keep uh, trucking moving, as I think people appreciate the the work they're doing now more than more than ever. Uh, um, and uh, you know, as far as we know, there's there's no. Kind of, uh, okay. Um. Okay, great. So we have a question. Um, Ari, you mentioned um, really shipping by ocean and as much as possible. Is there, would you recommend doing that even for shipments within the US? Shipments within the US, in other words, that are going to a uh, final destination inland? Yeah, so, so is there, like you mentioned, like sort of creatively rerouting. Could you talk a little mm -hmm. bit more about that? Sure. Yeah, um, and, and I mentioned this kind of in the context of transit times uh, as well. Um, so, you know, standard air freight, um, you know, in, in normal times could be five to seven days, you know, from a Shanghai to uh, in LA with an additional few days uh, for delivery. So by ocean, you're right now, you're only looking at an additional maybe 10 days, 15 days. So, um, and, that, and, and then on the trucking side, this, you know, similar uh, as before. So um, that that's kind of a, you know, one thing. And then once things come into the U.S., uh, like everyone else said, we aren't really seeing restrictions on trucking. So um, regardless of which mode you're shipping, we won't see much of, uh, much of a difference. So definitely not worth the premiums. And uh, in fact, um, a lot on the air freight, you know, the only, the only time another uh, that we see some air freight uh, uh, benefits is on kind of small uh, shipments that could kind of just be packed in. But if you're talking of kind of large shipments, we're seeing uh, significant problems especially as freight forwarders and, uh, and carriers need to kind of prioritize, uh, you know, uh, enterprise kind of customers, cargo um, and things like that over kind of standard, uh, you know, small, medium sized businesses, cargo. Um, so, um, so that's, that's really why I've just been kind of so gung ho on the, on ocean. Um, but there are some interesting things. I mean, I, I, you can definitely check out our website as well for some specifics. Like for example, if you're shipping into uh, an inland location like a Memphis, Tennessee, or anything in the Midwest uh, and looking at kind of West Coast versus East Coast, uh, you'll start to see as well some uh, interesting trends on, on the pricing side uh, where, you know, if there ends up being, you know, more congestion as things start getting uh, kind of, uh, you know, more congested maybe uh, on the West Coast, you may want to look at routing through the East Coast, for example, into, uh, into locations in the, uh, you know, the middle part of the country and things like that. So just kind of come at this with an open mind as you look at different options um, for your shipment. Okay, thanks, Ari. Um, we have some other questions coming in. One is about Mexican importers. Um, can you share some information about land freight and sea cargo for Mexican importers? Can anyone take that one? Uh, I, I'll take that one. Uh, we, we haven't seen uh, really 
over the road freight uh, or trucking uh, between Mexico and U.S. Uh, impacted much. Uh, this, um, you know, the companies that operate on the border uh, basically um, are operational, uh, and uh, there, there has been a big ramp up uh, on, on this trade lane, basically, and with all the logistics companies involved after the Chinese shutdown. And we haven't really seen any slowdowns uh, aside from a few that we know, which is anecdotal, uh, but basically a few companies moving their office uh, and administrative staff to work from home. But the warehouses, the CFS stations, all the transfer points are open and operational. In fact, uh, uh, with uh, uh, as far as I know, we restricted uh, travel between Mexico and US uh, over the road. So. Uh, there actually may be a positive effect on cargo for that because uh, there is some overlap in resources that handle uh, passenger uh, traffic uh, and, uh, and, and and cargo. Uh, so I don't expect uh, it's changed much. Uh, and, and ocean freight between U.S. and Mexico only makes sense on certain lanes. Uh, so uh, unfortunately, it's not a there's not a lot of options there. So um, trucking is, uh, I think, still the way to go, or in most cases. Okay, we'll take one more. Um, we have a question asking um, if anyone has some predictions on how the shutdown will impact the shipment industry in the long term, um, regarding demand or any other things you foresee happening. Anyone, uh, anyone want to take that one? Uh, I can say, uh, from my experience, what we're seeing uh, is, uh, is 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 actually incredible. Uh, we found out uh, last week some of the largest uh, companies in the industry uh, are having a hard time uh, working from home because they've never done it, uh, which is amazing uh, in this day and age. But uh, a lot of companies have uh, uh, sort of uh, IT built into their buildings, and uh, they're unable to take anything home. There's a lot of uh, smaller mom-and-pop forwarders who are not digital. They actually print everything. Every shipment is a folder with, I don't know, 50 pages of documents in them. And how do you take that home? So, um, unfortunately, uh, a lot of these guys are not going to survive uh, if this continues for another month or two. Um, and uh, the digital forwarders, the more tech-savvy and uh, advanced forwarders are the ones that are going to benefit. So I'm guessing uh, the long-term effect will be a lot of consolidation of smaller companies uh, and uh, definitely less uh, logistics companies out there. Uh, smaller ones being affected the most uh, is, is uh, my prediction. Ari, you don't want to add any predictions? Yeah, I was just going to, I wanted to add as well, just in terms of sourcing. Uh, I mean, I'm not sure the question, if they meant uh, kind of shipping or logistics or procurement. I mean, there's a lot of elements here, but on the, um, you know, from a sourcing or procurement standpoint, we're starting, we saw, because this really originated out of China and uh, that really was where a lot of uncertainty, uncertainty was and suppliers not being online for a month or two. Uh, we started to see a lot of customers of ours really investing a lot in uh, diversifying. So sourcing now from, for example, Southeast Asia, like Vietnam, Malaysia, uh, places like that. Also India, although India, I didn't mention too much detail as, a, as you probably all read, is now uh, has a three week shutdown, including as far as I've read um, factories as well. So that is an interesting uh, development. But before that, India was also being considered as well. Uh, for diversification. So that, that's an interesting aspect as well on the sourcing side uh, for anyone and, um, you know, for anyone that doesn't want to be overly dependent on China. Uh, it was just a, a few weeks ago that, you know, a lot of importers were quite nervous about uh, only importing from China. So don't forget about that um, as, as part of, and, and as you kind of plan your supply chain for the future. It's important to look at diversifying. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you so much for coming, everyone. Um, we really appreciate you taking the time. We hope you found it useful. Um, we hope you were able to clear up some questions and get a handle on some plans. Um, as, as Ari mentioned, um, 
you can, you can start booking now. Um, if anyone's ready to check out Fredos.com, you can run searches, you can compare prices um, and start to move forward with your shipments as, as quickly as possible. Um, so thanks again for joining us and most importantly, stay safe and healthy everyone and have a great day. And thank you again to our wonderful presenters. Thank you. Thank you. Bye everyone.